All right, welcome to Word in Your Ear. This episode of Word in Your Ear is supported by NordVPN. Now, there are, there are good reasons, many good reasons, for investing in NordVPN, most of them to do with keeping your data safe from those of evil intent who would, either at home or abroad, uh, never more than now, who would seek to steal your data or spy on your activity. Uh, VPN... As you know, Mark, stands for Virtual Private Network. I'm something of an expert now after last week. Absolutely. I'm up to speed. Absol- completely up I to speed. I see the value. <laughs> Absolutely. They can't, when, when you're in a virtual private network, they can't see your IP address or where in the world you are. And this is particularly useful for somebody like Alex Gold, who's a, a roving John Lennon impersonator who may find himself in any particular weekend, you know, washed up in some... Caribbean, uh, Caribbean port, uh, and communicating with the rest of the world via an internet cafe. And the beauty of this is nobody need know once he's behind NordVPN. So that's a time when you need to be extra careful of your security. And if at the same time you you you'll have the additional reassurance of knowing your traffic is encrypted. Um, so if you're like Mark and I watching old clips of Rick Wakeman's TV series Gas Tank on YouTube. <laughs> Have you been watching? Nobody, <laughs> I you have, know. Nobody need know, Mark. That's our secret. I know. So that, that's the serious side of it. But you, I know you want to know about the fun stuff, don't you, Mark? That's usually what you want to know about. Uh, NordVPN allows you to choose uh, to access the internet from one of more than 50 different countries which is quite exciting prospect, actually. At the beginning of a session, you decide, where do I feel like being? Where in the world do I feel like being today? Do I feel like being in Estonia or Mexico or the United States or Australia or wherever? And that means also if you take your laptop on holiday with you, you'll be able to access uh, UK news and programming without any difficulty. And if you're one of those people like me who can spend hours scrolling through the pages of streaming services, still thinking there's nothing you want to watch, you will, like me, take delight in finding out what they like to watch in Japan or Mexico and watching it too. That's how come yesterday, Mark, I watched a BBC drama about P.G. Woodhouse during the war which was on American Prime Video. Uh, why that should be available in America, but you can't get it in the UK. Is, it Brit- is that British know. made, then? It's British BBC made, yeah. And who's, Tim Pig- who's, who's, who, who's Tim Pickett Smith. Tim Pickett Smith played um, a Plum, and uh, Zoe Wanamaker was uh, his wife. His wife's name, I've forgotten. Cynthia, whatever. Uh, and it was obviously about the time he was, uh, you know, he was in Latuke, wasn't he? Yeah. The Germans swept in in 1940 and found himself interned, which led to all kind of, you know, embarrassment from which his career took an awful long time to it recover. Did. Anyway, still, there are that, still that, people, that. you know, lobbing, uh, you know, insults his way on. But I'll, I'll... Absolutely. Uh, but anyway, that, the, the reason that it was a nice surprise to find that is that, you know, all films are supposed to be region restricted for reasons that suit the rights holders but are a bit of mystery to, to you and me. And so with NordVPN, the beauty of this is you can completely shake that off. And it's thanks to this this week. Tell you what I watched this week. Cool. Oh, it's a documentary about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky on an American TV website, on a network TV website. A really long and surprisingly illuminating interview with Larry Hagman talking about his time on Dallas at, as JR which is absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. And, uh, and there's a whole uh, series yeah. on Lewinsky, isn't there? It was a, a fantastic recent series. Oh, that, what that, a yeah, that was, uh, yeah, the American crime story, what God, it's, it's called. Fantastic. Yeah. And then yesterday, I said, Niraz, I was watching for must be the nth time, the 1968 film Charge of the Light Brigade. Do you know that? Oh, the Tony Richardson film with uh, David Hemmings and David John Hemmings. Gilgan. John you get Gilgan it mixed up. I thought it was Michael Kenney. No, it's David Henry. I can see him now in the military jacket, the colonel's oh, jacket. Oh, it's fantastic. Fantastic film. And it, it makes me wonder, 
is the you know there there are certain films which if I come into a room and they're on, I just I just I perch on the edge of a sofa. I think I'll just watch it for a few minutes, and then I slowly slide into the sofa. Within and two next minutes, thing you know, a packet of crisps, and then I'm there hours later. Because there's just certain films that you want to watch again and again, and I wonder, I wonder if it's uh, if it's a kind of male thing. Because I'll tell you, there's two things I came across this week that I realised I watched again and again. One is Master and Commander. Fantastic. Um, I've seen that loads of times. It's a fantastic film. Which I, Russell Crowe playing Jack Aubrey, who's the creation of the, the novelist Patrick O'Brien. Uh, a film made by Peter Weir is set in the in Nelson's Navy in the Napoleonic Wars. And the other one, which I watch again and again, I don't you may not have seen this, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have you ever seen Moneyball? No, no, I haven't, no. Uh, where Brad Pitt plays Billy Bean, who's the, the real-life um, kind of general manager of, um, uh, of a, an American baseball team that just kind of revolutionized the way you bought and sold players. And... Um, I realized, I was thinking about this yesterday. Why do we watch these things again and again? And then in those two cases, th- this is what I think is going on, is you love to see mastery at work in a fictional context. You love to see somebody in charge. And, and uh, Russell Crowe as Jack Aubrey in Master and Commander does that absolutely perfectly. Fantastically. You know? And the wonderful and, and, thing about the fake ship and the lines, his lines are so good too. The lesser of two weevils, you know, all, all that stuff. And uh, I don't know whether it's because, you know, particularly at a time like now, as we, as we keep saying, you know, that you like to feel that something's in charge, don't you? <laughs> that yeah, somebody yeah. is in charge. It's somehow deeply comforting to watch Master and Commander or to watch Moneyball. I'll probably watch loads and loads of films like that, you know, just to feel that somebody's in charge, as opposed to the charge of the light brigade, which proved to be a catastrophic case of nobody in charge. You know what I mean? And the the world was a truly dangerous place. Uh, So, you know, there's the conclusions I came to by by watching these things. What draws you back to watch these things again and again? And uh, anyway, so that's NordVPN. Uh, you know, you can take advantage of a deal where you can try NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com slash your ear, or you can use the code your ear to get a huge discount off your um, NordVPN plan and one additional month for free. Can I just pitch for th- very quickly for four? The Italian job, some like it. Hot. All right. Brief encounter, waiting for government. Oh, God. A brief uh, encounter. But... Brief encounter. Oh, the, one of the best. Noel Coward and David Lean. One of the best script depictions of the idea of falling in love. It's amazing. Do you remember this? I watched it only the other night again. It's never off the telly. There's a bit where uh, where Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson have fantastic peak cap. Go out to a tea room. Do you remember that? Oh, it was yeah, a little quartet the, strike. It's a Lions tea room, yeah. yeah. That's right. And they, they look at one of the members of the quartet, the cello player, and think what an extra. They start they start to fantasize about the, about the imaginary lives these people have. It's just such a wonderful kind of intimate moment. You can really, really, it's so plausible. It's brilliant. And do you know why? I, I've watched Briefing Candle loads of times, and you know why it will never be remade? Every other great film has been remade. Well, because it probably briefing can- it's in black and white and it's impossible to, to do anything. No, no, Mark, Mark, think about it. They can't remake it because nothing Steam happens. Trades. Oh, nothing happens. Nothing happens. That's the beauty of Brief Encounter. No, there's that. They walk away. They, they never, walk they never away. get involved, do they? They, they go never, to the flat in, at one point. And you can't do that nowadays. It, it offends against the orthodoxy of the way films are made nowadays. That's the beautiful thing about Brief Encounter. It doesn't happen. So, you know, there you are. There you are. There's, there's a whole world of, of these riches out there that you probably haven't, uh, haven't accessed. And if you want to know more about NordVPN, full details in the show notes below. You're listening to a podcast from The Word. 
We're recording this on March the 13th, which is an, a significant date, isn't it, Alex and Mark? Go on, explain why. Well, two, because two years ago, uh, on this day, I think it was the first day of lockdown, wasn't it? Was it the first day of lockdown? I, really I, I think, yeah. it, yeah. sure I think it, was. it was. Yeah, And Go it on. was the day that we invented the concept of word in your attic, which is that we would get hold of various people, um, journalists and authors and musicians and broadcasters and, and, and comedians and PRs and rock photographers and sleeve designers and old record label people. And we would ask them to, on Zoom, to get out some of their old records. That was the plan, wasn't it? My life story told through old records that I used to love. And it, that's what it is. My life yeah. story told, told via old records, definitely. Yeah. Because And we, we did... Um, because the, the 13th, we, we had done a, an actual live word in your ear on the 8th, which is the Monday. We'd done it with Pete Perfides and Dan Franklin at the Islington, which was what we did every month, pretty much. Uh, and we had the next one planned. We were going to do another one, which was going to be in April. And that I was remember with- this because... I was in the um, the British Virgin Islands, and this was pre <laughs> any of us using Zoom. Um, this is it. And this we is we it. were emailing you all the time, saying, "Mate, don't you think you should probably come home?" And you go, "Why? What's well, kind yeah, of fun?" I, 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 no, no, it's seriously something bad is about to happen. I did you not know, understand what? it at all, you know, because I was so far removed. And uh, yeah, of course, after that, I got I got I, I think I spent two weeks away from London, and in that short space of time. The whole it was like getting back to something out of 28 days later. It was weird. But yeah, at the time you guys were, I remember you suggesting that maybe we 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 cancel this this event that we had planned. And I was like, why do we need to cancel it? Yes. <laughs> Not understanding <laughs> it at all. You, you did. So that was with I think the guest on or one of the guests on that one was due to be Paul Gorman talking about his Malcolm McLaren book. Yeah. And so we obviously had to had to cancel that. And so Paul, I think, was probably our first Word in Your Attic guest, wasn't he? Uh, no, it was no, Mark Billingham. No, he was talking about Word, word it was, oh, Okay, just Mark Billingham first. We just thought, let's first get old Mark Billingham. He's a really good talker. Oh, um, pick up a few records. We got him and I think people like Jude Rogers and uh, it just started Mark Lewis and he kind of took off from there. And they were fantastic. One of the one of the real turning points, I think, was Andy Partridge. We talked to him quite oh, early so, on. Yeah, and Andy yeah. Partridge really got to the spirit of it. He, he showed us his collection of things from old 1950s and 1960s cereal packets. Yeah, do you remember that? The little I free do. gifts you got in cornflakes. And I thought, this is brilliant. And also realised that, that there was a kind of therapy going on for everybody. It was just really fun to watch. It was really fun to do. And, uh, you know, and it was just fun for the, for the people participating in it. You know, it they really it's so funny. It's so funny when people get out, you know, like Andy getting out cereal packet things or he had a he had a thing off the front of a, off the off the hood of a of a of a delivery van, I think, from his childhood. Yeah, he did. The, 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 all this sort of stuff. And and it's usually at the point in our I, I realized this over a period of time. It's usually in the point in our conversation when the person talking goes, is it all right to talk about this? You think, yes, that's the sweet spot. You've been sitting. (laughs) We're all sitting at home in our attics, surrounded by the detritus of our lives. Wondering why we've kept him. Here is an opportunity. Why Why have you kept him? (laughs) This is why you've kept it. So that you can just share it with, you know, Thousands of people around the world who, who, strangely enough, can be interested in it and can feel some kind of some kind of link with you through it at, at this time. So, how many have we done, Alex? Did you actually do a count? I've got a rough count actually. So, <clears throat> since March thirteenth, twenty twenty, um, we have done one hundred and fifty word new attics. Actually, a couple more because I've got a couple queued up. 159. Sorry, I know the answer to this. It's 159. I just looked, which is pretty astonishing. Uh, the hours is. Okay, plus... Meteor um, was se- 100, if I can remember. 79 uh, classic podcasts, um, cool. plus word in your ears, which are technically about books specifically and not objects, um, plus um, about 100 weekly podcasts, mm-hmm. uh, plus all the little vignettes we've done, like... Um, uh uh oh gosh 
uh, yesterday's papers, the Patreon event we did. Oh, right. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, we did all kinds of die. We did occasional obituaries, didn't we? We have. Uh, plus the weekly yeah. quiz, of course, as well. About 100 of those. Um, oh, God. We've been a content God, factory. Been... I mean... <laughs> we we don't think of it as content. We don't think of it as a factory. But my God, we yeah. have been a content yeah. factory, haven't we? So, you know, I, w- I would be uh, failing my duty if I didn't point out at this point that if you'd like to be further involved in helping keep this show on the road, the way you can do that is by becoming a Patreon supporter. What are the advantages of being a Patreon supporter, Alex? Well, they are manifold, absolutely. First of all, you get um, the, the satisfaction of being in the in the Word in Your Ear community, which is a lovely place to be uh, for yeah. like-minded souls. Um you get uh, access to the weekly Word New Friday Night Quiz, which is at uh, 6 p.m. GMT which every is single Friday. Immensely good fun and good value. It is thoroughly absolutely. recommended. And there are prizes. There are there are there indeed are prizes. monthly prizes. You get the podcast early before the rest of the world, uh, and also if you choose to in vision, uh, seeing. Uh, our wonderful physogs on your screen as we're talking about the issue of, of, of the day. Uh, a weekly uh, classic podcast as well, where we go through the archives of, what was it, 14 years of word podcasts, um, picking out the best ones um, from over the years. Uh, and you can also um, enjoy a birthday present uh, to remember from Mark and Dave, which is something that no sane person should ever turn down. So That's when we shin we, down we your digital you. drain pipe. We effectively come to you and uh, go through your record collection and uh, and make cheap jokes about it. That's basically what we do. <laughs> Good fun. And uh, so it's all there, and you can find out how you can be involved if you go to patreon.com, word in your ear, uh, because, you know, so do it to celebrate our second birthday. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So we were talking last week about uh, Ed Sheeran, the court case involving Ed Sheeran and alleged plagiarism, um, and that's still rumbling on. And uh, I noticed also, did you see the story this week, Casey Perry, uh, who had previously lost a case about her supposedly taking some tune from somebody else, some judges have weighed dark in. Dark horse, isn't it? A rap yeah. Complaint. I think the agreement was she, that uh, she had to pay £2.1 million pounds and no longer has to pay it, which is amazing that's been turned around, isn't it? And I, it I is. feel a lot of sympathy for these people. Absolutely. No, she, the jury uh, <laughs> of, uh, of, of agree, have agreed that, the, that, that it wasn't particularly unique or rare. I'm reading it here that... Uh, in a 3 3 nil verdict, the court said Gray had been attempting to claim an improper monopoly over conventional musical building blocks when he first sued Perry in 2014. And I do think this is what an awful lot of this is about, you know, that as we discussed last week, you know, pop music is made out of very simple clay, isn't it, really? And, uh, well, you know... Did, did you see, you saw that, I think, the, the Will Hodgkinson who we had on the podcast recently, he wrote this piece in the Times, which I thought was really interesting, and he was talking about Blockbuster by the Suite. Yeah. And he said, you know, and it, it's basically the riff is... Dum, 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 dum. And they were about yeah. to put that out, and they were given a copy of David Bowie's new record, which is coming out two weeks before theirs, as it was the Gene Genie. And they just thought, and they, they clearly neither had heard the other, but they were thinking, this is unbelievably sim- similar. But both had actually nicked it from uh, I'm a Man by the Yardbirds, and the Yardbirds had nicked it from Manish Boy by Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters had nicked it from I'm a Man by Bo Diddley, and Bo Diddley had nicked it from Willie Dixon's Hoochie Coochie Man. And where did Willie Dixon get it from? So, well, absolutely. You know, that's just, that's the way it is, you know. And I, I feel a lot of sympathy. I feel a lot of sympathy for these people. And also I think... There's a really complicated dimension to this, which is what is what is composition? I was watching a documentary the other night, a new one, there's Amal Rajan interviewing Nile Rogers on BBC Two, I think it was just a couple of nights ago. And Nile Rogers tells the story of Let's Dance. Did you see mm. this thing? It was really interesting. And he I says didn't. I, David Bowie came to him with this yeah. little chord sequence, and he said it sounded like a very good dark-sounding folk song. And he said, okay, well, well, do you mind if I try and arrange it? And he, he inverted the chords and he changed the key, he changed the tempo and completely rearranged the whole thing and put in a syncopation and a rhythm. And that's effectively what made this song. I mean, he didn't write the lyric 
and he didn't write the melody. But you know, and he's not credit. He's not bitter about it. He's not. I'm sure he's very well paid. He wasn't credited as a songwriter. But I mean, it makes you realize there are so many elements that go into aren't there? making something, you know, an, an original composition. Oh, absolutely. But didn't he also with Let's Dance, wasn't he also the person who said, start with the chorus? Yeah. Because Nile Rogers always thinks that about everything. Yeah, there's know. that phrase, isn't there? Don't, don't bore us. Don't get bore us. Get, get, start with get the chorus. The chorus. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I have to think, that, you know, the most, uh, the most important role in making a hit record is very often the person, and it might be a musician, it might be a producer, it might be anybody, who just comes in there and kind of listens to it and goes, all right, that's fine, but why don't you just go... Click, you know, tweak, yeah, yeah. tighten it up somehow, you know. That's the thing that makes the kind of breakthrough, you know. But the idea, you know, the, the, the idea of judges and lawyers sitting in the courtroom trying to get themselves into the heads of the, of the way people make records, particularly nowadays, isn't it, Alex? Because so much of yeah. it is people sending bits and pieces of the, of the proposed record to each other via the internet or whatever, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think I think Get Lucky, Daft Punk's Get Lucky was uh, written and recorded completely remotely, which is really fascinating. But um, I never think that um, it's 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 malicious either. I think you know, if a musician's taking a lifting a piece from another piece, it's it's genuinely because they really love it and they want to present yeah. it in a, in, a, in a new way. It's it's a really difficult one to call. But also, I mean. Uh, you know, from a, from a pra- pragmatic point of view and a technical point of view, there are only 12 notes in a Western chromatic scale. So there's only so many combinations you can get anyway. Yeah. You know, there is going yeah. to be natural crossover. And where do you draw the line? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky one. I'll when, tell you the other thing when, that struck me this week, thinking about the Sheeran case, is if you've written, you've made a record, you've written a song, and you reckon a year later, Ed Sheeran has, and his collaborators have somehow taken a bit of it and and made a hit out of it that must surely mean they won't be the only people to have done that if they did that hundreds of other people must have done the same thing as well it stands to reason but they're never pursued (laughs) because they haven't made enough money for it to be worth it that's the point it's all about money it's never about credit it's would the ship have gone hit? after George Harrison if he, if my sweet lord had, had flopped? No, they wouldn't. And George not, Harrison not. said very, very poignantly after that case was settled and he lost it, he said, I don't even want to touch the guitar or piano in case I'm touching somebody else's note. I thought it was a really interesting quote. Uh, you must feel that. i tell you what it reminded me of. It reminded me of VAR. You know, it's like you, you think you've written a hit, but no, you've got to go back and you've got to analyse yeah. it from eight different yeah. angles. It's a kind That's of coitus what... interruptus before you could actually go, it's a goal. It is a hit. I wrote it. Well, that's what McCartney did with yesterday, wasn't it? He went around with all his friends saying, have you heard this one before? Have well, you heard we talked about that last week. I week. think that's not yeah. uncommon with songwriters generally. They, they, there are certain things that just occur to them so completely that they think I must have heard this before because it, it just arrived so, so fully formed. Um, and so many chord I, sequences as well. There's a, I was just looking at something the other day and it said that uh, journeys don't stop believing. John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads, James Blunt's You're Beautiful, Lady Gaga's Paparazzi and Elton John's Can You Feel the Love Tonight all have exactly the same chord sequence at one point. I'm sure they do. I mean, they're just, there yeah. are only so many sets of certainly four chords revolving that, that don't sound, you know, similar. Well, there's, there's that fantastic medley by, I think it's Walk the Earth, where they demonstrate that. They So they play a, um, a snap of, 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 of about 100 songs with the same chord sequence um, and squeeze it all into four minutes and layer them on top of each other. Um, songs you'd never even think are related, but uh, there is... No, no. It's it's really interesting just yeah, how yeah. much of pop just naturally overlaps like that, you know. But um, so much of this is just about, you know, it, it it it's a kind of unique business, isn't it? In the sense that that you can do something tiny in popular music that can prove to be massively profitable, and it's the profit that people come after. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nobody goes chasing a writer over a sentence because the sentence could never have the economic power that the tune has. Yeah, you, you can't see what I mean? argue that that sentence is what made that book successful or whatever. I mean, it's just, it, it's just nothing, there's no way you can but, justify it. Have you ever been plagiarised, Mark? I haven't been plagiarised, but I, I, 
No, never. And uh, I, I have had the weird because I'm very interested in the idea of co comedy as a kind of intellectual property. Stuart Lee um, did a fantastic, wrote a fantastic piece about this about uh, uh, the comedian Joe Pasquale stealing a joke from somebody. I thought that was really interesting because actually a joke has got real value. You can build a a TV show about a, around a joke. And if it looks like you've stolen it from somebody who is in fact the person who stole it from you, you have got a right to be upset. And I've had the weirdest I've got to plagiarism is hearing a joke, if you can call it that, that I wrote, quoted back to me. And uh, it, when, I, when I wrote my, my book, I, I, it's lying about Van Morrison. And I said, there's two types of people in the world. There's the, the people who like Van Morrison and the people who met him. And I've heard that joke. To, people said, well, think about Van Morrison, of course, <laughs> as the old joke yeah. goes. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and, and I was <laughs> thinking, but I wrote that. And then you get a tiny, tiny inkling of what it must feel like if somebody did steal something that you wrote and passed it off as theirs. Or, or... Actually, can I confess something about that line? So whenever I have played Brown Eyed Girl at any kind of function in the past, I've always <laughs> used that. And I always thought, a wiser man than me once told me. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It's my little homage to you, Mark. I owe you. I've, uh, inevitably, I've had it attri attributed to me. You know, this is yeah, all, yeah, always yeah, happens yeah, with yeah. Uh, with Mark and myself. You know, people say, as David Hepworth said, and I, and I, was, I never said that at all. You know? yeah. But I, I know the man who did. <laughs> the Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Dave, you said to me the other day, and I'm tantalised to know what the answer is. You said that <laughs> was only one. You said it's impossible for any group to be completely original. You think there's only one example of a group that is. Who is that? Okay, I'll tell you who it is. It, it, you know, because you go and listen to loads of great groups, you know, and you, you can hear the building blocks, you know, that go into what they, what they did. You know, they based it on it earlier you know, catalogue or an earlier sound or whatever. And you can hear that in every group. The group that that I think are kind of oddly original, were or oddly original, a group I, I don't even particularly warm to, but immensely popular. I think the Smiths were really original because I can't hear where that came from at all. That sound seemed to me to be a product of those human individuals just expressing themselves rather than them trying to sound like somebody else. Now, you guys uh, are, you know, more on board with the Smiths than, than I am. Do you think there's anything in it? God, you that's, know? A, that's a really good point. I'm not sure I've ever yeah. thought of it. Because if you, I remember hearing this charming man for the first time <clears throat> and thinking that the guitar part on that sounded like African high life music. That the, the syncopation, yeah. uh, the way that he just plays these little tiny abrupt chords very, very high up. And that it's a very complicated series of kind of little melodies and chopped sections. And it's not based on anything that's familiar, is it? It's not rock and roll. It's not R&B. It's not folk music. It's not a series of four chords or whatever. So that's and a you really got, good point. And you've got the same, the same thing with Morrissey's songs, which are just, they're just expressions of his personality. The shape of them doesn't obey the same shape of, as anything that had gone before. You can't think, oh, he got that from David Bowie or wherever else he might have, might have got it from. He just thought, they're just, they're just, it's what came out of their heads. And there must be some element of the fact that those songs were recorded as backing tracks and given to him with no idea what the melody would be like. I think that's quite interesting because normally you write a chord sequence with an idea of what the melody, what yeah. the tune is going to be. And he simply applied tunes over the top. If indeed they are tunes, sometimes they're not. They're kind of, they're not, they're not. They're just, they're just, uh, they're, they're they're performances. monotones, aren't they? They're, sometimes they're performances. Yeah. yeah, they are. And, yeah. and yeah, you, I, I, well, okay. Another way of putting it is: tell me what those early Smiths records were trying to sound like, because normally with bands, you can tell what they're trying to sound like, and then their style comes out of attempting to do something yeah. and then doing something slightly different. I can't tell what it is that the Smiths are trying to sound like if it's not the Smiths. No, and it should have been David Bowie. It should have been T-Rex. It should have been the things that he was, Morris in particular, was so enthused about. But, I mean, you're absolutely right. You, you can't see any precedent for it at all.
I really can't. I think Johnny Marr approaches music in a way more in a way that a, a composer does than a songwriter does, or even a painter. Um, and uh, I think he thinks about music in a very lateral way. So rather than thinking about thinking about sounding like someone else, he knew knew the kind of picture he wanted to evoke. Um, but you listen to the way his guitar parts are put together and the and 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 the space in those songs as well. You know. I don't think he was really thinking about music as music when he was writing, if that, that makes sense. And um, But uh, it just blows my mind that you said something positive about this mistake. <laughs> there you go. Stay tuned. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. So somebody tweeted the other day, Dave, um, a piece that you'd written in Sounds about Brian Eno's Music for airports, which was how long ago? 43 years, 1979, Mark, which I realized is 43 years ago. It's absolutely extraordinary. And you know, people post old reviews you've written, and sometimes you remember. And I had no memory of this whatsoever, but the interesting thing was that they posted, you know, the actual the layout, you know, with the picture and, and the headline and so forth. And um, and it, it struck me that nobody was ever going to do that in the future, because you can't you can't repost some old, you know, something that somebody put on Facebook in two thousand and four, and think it's going to ever have the same impact. Because the thing about reading old newspapers or magazines is you're simultaneously reading content and context, aren't you? You're yeah. looking at the frame completely. You're seeing, you, you're seeing the adverts around it or the cover date at the bottom or the picture, or all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's time travel, isn't it? In, in a way that, you know, the internet has kind of robbed, is taken from us. You know, you can't do that anymore. And but so I saw that and I looked at it. The first thing I, 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 I reacted to was the typeface. I thought, that sounds. It didn't say sounds. Yeah. I thought, that sounds. No, but I remember no. sounds. Also, that's the kind of headline sounds would write. And those headlines yeah. and those intros are so much a part of it. The picture, the picture caption. You're absolutely right. And, it, I mean, and I, I was kind of intrigued to see it, really, because when people post old reviews you've written, and they, they go, oh, you got that wrong or whatever. You think, oh, well, all right. You, you, that, that, those, the, those are the breaks when you review records, you know. But, but that, of all the records, oddly enough, Music for Airports, which was the first, it was his first ambient record, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. AMB001 was, uh, was the catalogue number. And I think, Oddly enough, it proved to be it's a very significant record, isn't it? Incredibly Music for airports. I and, really uh, remember it I, coming out and he made there was a quote, a little interview with him. And he said he's trying to make music that was as ignorable as it was interesting. And I thought, I have never heard anybody say anything like that about music before. You'd think the whole idea of music, it's got to be completely captivating. But no, yeah. this was this was meant to be something that you had on the back. In fact, in your review, brilliantly, you test it out, don't you? You, well, you, you do, you claim to go, so it's good for putting out cats and cooking or whatever we say now. <laughs> That's really but, funny. But, but uh, no, somebody, <laughs> somebody got in touch with me and, and having read it and said, well, did you listen to this sort of Walkman? And of course, this was pre-Walkman, actually, 1979. I think the Walkman only arrives 1980, 81 yeah, or something yeah, like that. Um, so, you know, this would have been a record. And I must just have been given this record by Eric Fuller from Sounds and just, you know, there must have been some press release with it saying that it was ambient and so forth. And I just I just had to write about that. And... Um, and it, it, it proved to be it's proved to be very significant. You know, it's just it's just a really odd thing to see that and to realise how long ago it is. You know, well, well, well we we we, was, we were talking about this week uh, earlier earlier today on Twitter, weren't we? Yeah, about we were with a couple of how long ago? Ago? Blue Monday. Go on. Wasn't it? Go on. Blue Monday is now was now further far further away. We're further away from Blue Monday than Blue Monday was from D Day. Was that right? No, from the Second World War. Yes. I know it's absolutely <laughs> incredible. <laughs> all this, all this just goes on absolutely yeah. all the time. Yeah. So Noel Gallagher says um, there there are going to be no more working class bands because guitars are too expensive. Isn't that what he says, Alex? Did you? Did you see this? I've seen something like that, yeah. 
I think he's got a point actually, but also as as the whole band paradigm changes, so you're getting people who build careers on Instagram now, and um, uh, um, and the base standard of production, the base standard of presentation is is a lot higher, um, and therefore what people, the standard people expect requires nicer gear to get to, if that makes sense. Oh, so, does it? I think so, yeah. Um, a nice little studio set with a decent mic, you know, all that kind of stuff, a little synthesizer, you know, um, I think it'd be very difficult for a band like the pistols, for example, to break through now because simply because people expect something that's a little bit more polished or a little bit more professional. With something like the pistols. I mean, there isn't a lot of that to do with just the live circuit that, you know, all those bands who couldn't afford very much apart from some rudimentary equipment to go out and play. At least they were visible all the time. And that's how you got signed as A&R men went to a pub somewhere that you were playing and, and, and saw you and signed you up. I mean, that, that doesn't feel to me as though that's as flourishing an area as it, as it used to be. And also it's not how you get signed anymore, is it? You get signed from people. You no, know. especially not after the past, past two years, you know, yeah, the yeah. completely changed. Um, I think people's ears have become more refined and more more attuned to, to high quality content. And, um, but, but, and but isn't the isn't the kit nowadays, relatively speaking, isn't it cheaper than it's ever been? Because you know, if you go back to the early sixties, if you you wanted to start a group, the Beatles or uh, millions of groups who started in the wake of the Beatles, starting a group was quite an expensive business and could only be achieved by. <laughs> you know, hear me out here. Higher purchase. Nobody could afford to go and buy that stuff. They all went and got their parents to sign the higher purchase agreement, and they'd buy the base over a period of about three years. Nobody's doing that anymore, are they? Actually, I recall you know, me- in Tony Fletcher's Keith Moon book. That was how Keith Moon got his first drum kit. Absolutely, on the, ne- on the Never Never. Is well, the- all yeah, of yeah. them. Did. All tick. of them. You know, yeah, yeah, that stuff was. You know, and in the fifties and say, well, uh, you know, the American stuff was, uh, you know, it had been it had been embargoed after the war. They couldn't import stuff at all. Whereas nowadays, this kit is absolutely everywhere, isn't it? Music making kit has never been cheaper, hasn't it? But it it could be that a rock and roll band's equipment is more equi- more expensive than it's ever been before. But the stuff to do this sophisticated stuff, I mean, you know. It used to be, you, you know, the, the extraordinary synthesizers, you know, the early 80s, the things that could make the sound of absolutely anything. There are only about four people in the world that could afford them. Whereas nowadays... Now you've got it in your garage, Ben. They're on your phone. <laughs> yes, you know? right. And uh, it, it's just, it's very different, you know. So, and also talking about the, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, nobody can afford to to get equipment uh, nowadays. Well, the Sex Pistols reputedly stole it, didn't they? That was, yes, they did. that was, that was how they and then uh, boasted about it loudly. Yes, absolutely. Steve Jones, That's Steve Jones, it. yeah, changed it. You know, yeah. so I'm not, I'm not so sure about about Noel's argument about it being economic. You know, because people find a way to do these things, but it, it's more the case that are there are there kids wanting to make rock and roll noises? anymore not at the moment it doesn't sound like it you know uh but we shall see watch this space you're listening to the word podcast where the time is whenever you want it to be oh before we talk about bob dylan because you've got some news about bob dylan um i i happened to be looking at uh oh, what bob dylan film was it the other day i can't remember don't look back i think it might was well, some some documentary of course nowadays all films come with a little bit of a trigger warning at the beginning, don't they? You know, that this contains... Oh, yeah, upsetting maybe scenes. Outdated. Don't come crying to us. Violence, whatever. What, what's what's on, <laughs> on Don't Look Back? I think it was Don't Look Back. It goes, occasional bad language, comma, smoking. Yeah, smoking. <laughs> smoking. Smoking. And, of course, they're having to go through absolutely every film. Well, made get before back at one of those warnings, didn't it? Get yeah, back. This is it. Smoking. Smoking. Excessive bis- biscuit consumption and smoking. It's right. <laughs> I was watching the other day. I was watching. Do you ever see that film, Eighty Four Charing Cross Road, uh, and Bancroft and Anthony Hopkins film made in the eighties, uh, based on uh, the story, the true story of a correspondence between a New York author and a, and a Charing Cross Road bookshop. 
And anyway, um, every time Anne Bancroft appears, she lights up a cigarette. To the extent it's so rare nowadays to see this in a film, you think, is this going to be a major plot point? You know what I mean? Is she going to is she going to expire of emphysema or something like that <laughs> halfway through the film? Because you think if anybody who's smoking in a film, it must be the main point of the film. And when she appears and um, she has a, a bottle of gin in her hotel room, you think, oh, she's bound to expire through alcoholism or something halfway through the film. No, it's because just all these regular life. It was just regular life. Normal life. life. It's all have a drink. <laughs> But also, so the smoking anyway, looked so gorgeous in films, didn't it? It just, yeah, I suppose so. As it did in jazz photos. So you've got hot news about Bob Dylan, Mark. Well, I, hot. I think it's probably it's out, but he's got a new book coming out, which is very exciting, isn't it? In November. Oh yeah. And the yeah. cover picture is called "The Philosophy of Modern Song," Catchy. and the cover picture is of Little Richard and Eddie Cochran and a, a girl who I, I, I can't confess I'd never heard of. I looked her up. Found out who it was Alice Leslie. Oh right, as Leslie, Leslie, Leslie was on. known as the kind of female Elvis Presley. She's a rockabilly star. Okay, uh, sixty essays that he wrote about various people. And all we know is he's written about Stephen Foster, who's the guy who wrote Camp Town Races and Swanee River, a major part of uh, yep. American culture. He's written one about Elvis Costello. How thrilled would you be? If you were Elvis oh, Costello and found oh, that there was going to be a chapter in Dylan's upcoming book about yep. you as a songwriter. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. He's written one about Hank Williams, he's written one about Nina Simone. Um, I can't, can't wait to read it. Don't you think can I? Can I? Can I'm I almost just, as excited just, about this as more of his autobiography. I mean, it's him writing about other songwriters. Brilliant. I, I don't want to in any way rain on your parade at all. I'm just going to I'm just going to propose a little a little question mark here in this whole thing. So Bob Dylan wrote, you know, Chronicles whenever it was. When did that come out? 15 years ago or something like yeah, that? Yeah, about that, yeah. Which was presented as a as an autobiography. But it later transpired. It was a load of sleep notes he'd written it. And the, uh, around the reissues of various various albums, I think it was whatever. It was Oh Mercy, wasn't it? And uh, Freewheeling. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do you think Bob Dylan writes these things? Do you think he writes all of them? Or do you think that he possibly has researchers or assistants and so forth to help with these things? Because, you know, if, you, if you're going to write a book, and I don't know how many words this might be, 80,000 or something like that, it takes a certain amount of application. <laughs> You've got to sit down every day and do it. And Bob Dylan just doesn't work like that. No, he doesn't. He? Well, that's a good point because I mean, his theme time radio hour didn't work like that at all. And they made no bones about the fact that, that was entirely scripted, wasn't it? And he made he made no effort to conceal that he was reading a script. He read it sometimes in the most wooden way. You could virtually <laughs> hear him turning the pages because someone had gone back and said, "This is who." You know, this is what the life that Hank Williams was leading in 1957 or something. And clearly Dylan is not going to spend hours of his valuable time working it out for himself. So the answer to that is, no, I would have thought that the bare bones of that might have been researched by somebody. He might even have discussed it with someone who transcribes it and knocks it into essay form. I don't know. But it's still going to be Dylan talking about. No, I agree. About particular and songs. I, no, and I'm, sure that, particular I'm sure that's really interesting. And that is I'm just, I'm just the idea of, uh, of of kind of sitting down and writing stuff, you know, is the, it requires a certain discipline. D Dylan ringing his phone. Uh, yeah, doing 2,000 words a day. <laughs> 10,000 a week, I'm nearly there. <laughs> it, it, it requires a certain amount of discipline, which musicians tend, tend to be. I, don't, I think I, I'm being rather sniffy about musicians here, Alex. Those musicians fine. tend to tend to find rather difficult because, oddly enough, the uh, you also get those autobiographies, and Morrissey is one case, and Elvis Costello is another case where neither of them seem capable of grasping the thing that really takes a lot of time for writers, which is rewriting and cutting, isn't it? And so Morrissey's autobiography was massively too long, wasn't it? As was Elvis Costello's. Well, it wasn't that it was too long. It was, it was long-ish. It was just that it was incredibly, it needed editing. 
Whereas, yeah. you know, it needed it needed arranging. Elvis's one just needed cutting down. I mean, it was just fast. I've got it above me somewhere. And it was just, it's a brick-like tome. Isn't it? It's impossible to read. It's so huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see. I, I'm sure it'd be a really good read. I, I've got no doubt about it. It'll be a really good read. However many people were involved in it. Doesn't he also have people to do his metal work for him? <laughs> <laughs> well, he does, just, doesn't he? he weld that hubcap onto that old uh, <laughs> old gate for me. What I thought that? he has a couple of metal workers uh, on his estate, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> does, he, <laughs> does he have someone doing his painting for him? I don't know. I would be Well, a lot of his painting, of course, was prints that he was supposed, supposedly hand-coloured himself. But he has got, to be fair, he is unbelievably active, isn't he? Isn't he opening a museum in May? He's got, <laughs> a, he's got a, yeah, he's got a, he's got a, a huge... Uh, exhibition of his paintings coming up quite soon, and he's on tour again. I mean, at least he's doing <laughs> stuff. No, I got listen. Well, we, we love him dearly. We love him dearly. We do. But does he does he get up every morning and have a to do list? No, I don't I think, think he not. does. I, think I, don't, I don't think he thinks. Get shopping, do metal work, write two thousand words in the you know songwriter's book, write some new tunes, yeah. prepare my Paint Christmas something. album for the year after next. I don't think he does that at all. You know. I think he just wanders around. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, you should uh, mention the other great news story, Elon Musk and Grimes. Oh, go on. go on. I think go it's on, worth on. mentioning because Elon Musk and Grimes already had a child, didn't they? A son called XAEA12, which is pronounced XAI Archangel, as if you need to be told. That okay, day. okay. Nicknamed X. And then Grimes was doing an interview with Vanity Fair at her home. And the journalist, this is very recent, and the journalist heard a baby crying in another room and said, have you got a, a new baby? She said, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. That's classic. I mean, that's, re- that's romantic, isn't it? That really is. But eventually, I think the idea was an exchange with a PR or a manager or an agent or something, and it was a, something maybe was signed, and she came back, was able to discuss the fact that they had had another child, um, surrogate mother. And uh, the child is called Exa Dark Sidereal Musk, which sounds like wow. a name for a perfume or something, doesn't it? They're going to grow up well balanced, aren't they? And Exa refers to exaflops, a term meaning the ability to perform one quintillion floating point operations in a second. I mean, for God's sake, really. What's wrong with Stephen? What's wrong? It's not Gertrude, it's not Beryl, it's not Mavis. We used to, I mean, we used to get excited about Moon Unit. You remember and think that was a bit old, Dave? Remember Moon <laughs> Unit and God, Paul Cantor and Grace Slick's child, God. And, I'll tell you uh, what. And I'll Blanket. You what, One of my favourites is Blanket. Blanket. Didn't Michael Jackson have a child called Blanket? Oh, I God, think yeah, Jacket. Oh, and Your Majesty. Your Majesty is still my absolute favourite of all. Your Majesty Jackson. Mm. Of course, the children eventually get their revenge on you by when they grow up, they change their names to something straightforward, don't they? So Keith Richards' daughter, Dandelion, had her name changed to Angela. Angela, she, that's right. In yeah. her 20s, because she wanted them something straighter. Zoe, but, Zoe Bowie. He's Duncan now, isn't he? Duncan. Yeah. yeah. Roland Duncan. Bolan. Did he change his name? Uh, no, I think he's still Roland Bowie. Roland Bowie. Still Roland Bowie. Zach Starr is still Zach Starkey, isn't yeah. he, and so forth. But I tell you what, I'm uh, I'm always intrigued by this. Which old names uh, you think are never going to come back? My dad was called Ernest, and he hated the name, name Ernest, and he always used to say that'll never come back in any shape or form. Well, you know, my 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 wife named was having, Shackleton, having, presumably. Having a yeah, possibly, yeah, actually, never thought of that would have been because that was 1914. When was your dad born? Yeah, we had dad born in 1919, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. so it probably would be, yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, my wife was having a haircut recently when uh, when she's introduced a small baby, baby who was called Ernest, you know, so we thought that's wow. coming back. We we're in the playground, we we're at the playground yesterday with the grandchildren, and I heard somebody calling for a small child called Percy. That's no, lovely. No, I thought it's that funny you should say that because oh. only the other day I was I was talking to my fellow Beatles and bemoaning the fact that, that there are no Percy's anymore, specifically no Percy's. That's astonishing. The Percy's bad. I've got a movie called Arthur, which is a wonderful name. It's so nice. Oh, it, oh so, no, yeah, I think you get quite a few Arthurs. Oh, yeah, because they, they sound quite dignified, Arthur, you know. 
uh, is a king and so forth. Kingly, but, yeah. But yeah, I was surprised by Percy. So anyway, you know, they can all come back in time. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.